It's a great honor to, to be here uh, in this session. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Norberto, for the invitation. And uh, actually, since I come back to my home country in 2008, and Professor Griff is here, and he helped me a lot to do that, I was thinking about what is neuroscience. And uh, in 2008, I said, maybe I can save the date for the next one. And uh, I'm happy to be here in this, in this meeting, in, mainly in this session, with uh, some important researchers like Professor Anders Kerner, that uh, in this, this very interesting review uh, gives some some main lines for our study regarding the neurobiological approach uh, of depression and how can you understand a little bit better about uh, the link between depression and seizures. And, and in, this, in, in this Lancet review, Professor Kanit uh, emphasized as one of the main points the hyperactivity or HPE axis. And this is, is one of our main focus of study since uh, we work in the King's College London and, and developing these uh, follow-up studies here at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, actually, we have a, a great influence of uh, the group of uh, Professor De Cloé and Professor Marin Yogos uh, and try to understand a little bit about this in this very nice review about stress, hippocampus and epilepsy, uh, and which could be the next point, the next question about uh, these links. Uh, and again, uh, HP axis could be one of our answers to understand a little bit about that. And so my talk will focus on, on HP axis and how this uh, so, so uh, limited and so uh, important uh, disease, I can say it's a disease, depression, uh, could uh, could be a, a little bit better treatment and uh, understand it. Uh, as you can see in this very nice review uh, from Sibyl and French uh, published this year, uh, depression is a very chronic illness, and you, you you need to to try to stop this this cycle uh, to avoid relapse and uh, to. Uh, achieve uh, the remission of these patients. Uh, I have a link with uh, the Netherlands, Professor Jogos. I, I did a master in effective neuroscience in the Maastricht, and uh, I, I, I have an honor to learn a little bit of, with Professor Von Praak. In one of his review uh, approach, how can stress cause depression? In Brazil, we have a, a very big influence uh, from uh, North American psychiatry in one of the, the main uh, figures, probably Professor Anders can know, is Bob Post. Uh, Robert Post from the NIH developed these uh, important studies about kindling and about sensitization you know, to affective disorders, where the main, uh, the, the, the first episodes, you can have a stronger uh, triggers uh, in precipitant of the first episode. In the following of the, the illness, uh, spontaneous episodes could, could be developed, and so this is, could be a, a kindling model that could be linked with affective disorders, depression, and why not say that I will talk a little bit about bipolar depression as well. And so, uh, Chronic stress is, is really uh, an important point to uh, increase cognitive dysfunctions, change emotions and change feelings uh, in chronic uh, uh, difficulties. And as Bruce McKean showed in, in this very nice uh, review and in all of his studies about stress and adaptation, you can see that uh, major life uh, events depends on, on how environment stressors and, and trauma situations, and then is one of the points that I will try to uh, 
go deeply is uh, early life stress, early life trauma uh, in child and, and adolescent, and how this distress could be perceived uh, and change behaviors uh, in according to the vulnerability of uh, each uh, subject. And so uh, you can have a, a physiological response that could be uh, some, some kind of adaptation or could be the development of allostatic load. And so you, you have been working in this, in this model for some years and uh, you try to understand a little bit how depression could be uh, understood as a, a kind of stress in this axis, the HPA axis, and, and how these receptors, mainly MR receptors at the hippocampus and GR receptors, could be uh, understood uh, in the linkage of uh, the release of cortisol and why uh, people with depression and why not say with epilepsy could have these changes in these main uh, uh, receptors of the HPA axis. Another challenge, and uh, I'm here working, uh, following some studies of Professor Griff, uh, serotonin in the half your nucleus will have a link with this HPA axis hippocampus with the two receptors, MR and GR, uh, hypothalamic uh, nucleus with GR receptors and uh, pituitary with uh, GR receptors as well. And so you can have a link with another neurotransmitter that is locus ceruleus uh, with the noradrenergic uh, input that could increase this, uh, this system. And so the challenge is try to integrate in a comprehensive way the neurotransmitters and this HPA axis. Uh, in this, this, this is a, a, a very nice painting from Monet and then you can see here a relation between a mother and, and her child. Uh, but even in this so harmonic uh, painting, you can have some uh, bomb of more than 700 synapses that could change uh, sensory language and cognitive function, mainly in the first years, first months uh, of development. So if you have uh, strong situations like early life trauma. It is another painting like Picasso can, can, can show a different situation. Here you can see probably strong nightmare for the mother and difficult situation for the child. And so this is will uh, change this, this development. And if you think about maltreatment, it, it could be really stronger uh, in early life stages of development maltreatment, abuse, neglect could really change the situation uh, and probably uh, in vulnerability, uh, people with genetic potentials, uh, probably this, the environment, the stressor, the early life stress, the maltreatment could switch on these, these points. Uh, I work in the King's College and actually I'm still doing some, some uh, studies there. Uh, and I have a collaboration with Professor Avshalom Kaspi that really, in a very nice studies, ha have shown uh, the relation between maltreatment and some kinds of vulnerability. For, for example, here, the serotonin transporter. And so uh, th this, this study shows clear, clear, clearly that uh, early life stress could uh, really change these kinds of uh, subtypes of depression, for example. And Charlie Nemeroff did a very nice study with Christine Hines showing that uh, childhood trauma uh, may lead to neurobiological unique uh, mood disorders, quite different from people without uh, any kind of trauma. Uh, we did some studies in the collaboration with the Brown University, our group uh, in London, Carmine Parianti, and, and the group of uh, Linda Carpenter and uh, the University of Sao Paulo, Professor uh, Del Porto and Ange uh, Andrea Mello. That is in the same line that the studies that uh, Christine Hein published in the cycle neuroendocrinology showing that uh, vulnerability, 
could be linked with some situations of trauma, uh, of with our life stress to develop changes in the uh, central nervous system phenotype. And if this trauma uh, are really uh, chronic, without social support, you can develop uh, uh, subtypes of depression that could be followed in a physiological response. Uh, I really like this 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 paper, and so for for the students, I think is 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 a, a, a nice review from Sonia Lupin, Bruce McQueen, and Christine Hein. I don't know the third author, Gunnar, uh, and they show uh, in a in a, st a stress across lifespan how uh, amygdala could uh, be uh, impairment and uh, how the HPA axis uh, could change the program in uh, frontal cortex, hippocampus, and changes the, the, the levels of glucocorticoids. And, and so how, how it could differentiate in different phases of the development, post postpartum, adolescence, and, and even in adulthood. I'm a clinical psychiatrist, so uh, my idea is try to show how, how you can see this in, the, in patients. And, and the people from Columbia University, the group from Jonathan Stewart, have shown that uh, depression with a, a, a typical features with uh, hypersonia and craving for carbohydrates will be more associated with trauma history. And in this uh, paper that they published in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry this year, they show that uh, more than 50% of the, the patient with a typical depression will have life trauma. And uh, melancholic and other uh, uh, depression without the typical features will have very lower uh, history of uh, life, life tra time trauma. And so the history of trauma appears in patients with a typical depressions. And these patients uh, will report more traumatic experience uh, even uh, before or, or in the falling of depression onset. And so I'd like to make a, a short summary, especially for the people that are arriving now. Uh, stressors activate sympathetic and HPA axis system. Glucocorticoids can regulate stress response through two different uh, receptors, mineralocorticoid receptors and glucocorticoid receptors, and both of them are in a, a, a at least a two-way interaction. If you have a chronic stress, uh, the physiological problems will uh, be demonstrated in, in the neurodocrine dysfunction. Of course, this is, will happen in people with vulnerability, uh, and so uh, the stress response uh, will be linked with genetic pattern. Uh, a Brazilian uh, Psychiatry, Flavio Kapsinski developed a very nice model uh, about uh, comorbidity of metabolic problems. And so you can see here uh, recurrent mood uh, episodes could change uh, damage uh, in, in uh, oxidative stress. And you, you can see in neuroimaging structural changes and then uh, in a clinical approach, you can see these patients with uh, depression, with uh, treatment-resistant depression. Uh, these patients decrease coping, and as I, I mentioned, Bob Post's studies, they have a, a, a kindling, kindling uh, model, and then it will be increased if they have life stressors, and then the cycle, uh, the cycle continue with a recurrent mood episode. But if you can see this paper that we published with Professor Wagner Gattaz and uh, Rodrigo uh, Vieira, that is a friend that is working in the NIMH uh, in, in US, uh, we, we measure plasma cortisol in, in naive bipolar patients in their first uh, episode. And you can see that patients with uh, manic uh, episode will have lower levels of cortisol and uh, different patterns uh, regarding if they have euphoric uh, features uh, or uh, irritable mood. In this study that was published uh, in American Journal of Psychiatry, you can see if the patients have several 
manic episode, you can see a change is mainly in the ventricular area. This is quite different from patients that you assess that you have just first or uh, very beginning of, of this illness. And so uh, the chronic stress of bipolar will, will change uh, structural areas like uh, ventricular uh, in, in, in main, many areas of our, our nervous system. Uh, I, I like to emphasize that 90% of these patients will have uh, manic psychotic episode. I was just talking a little bit about this, this uh, model that Pace and Spencer developed with uh, Professor Yogos. Uh, and I, I believe that uh, this is quite interesting. Probably you are, you are going further than this, but uh, in a schematic way, you, you can say that uh, the MR uh, receptors will be uh, quite activating uh, lower stressor intensity and novel intensity uh, environmental, and then uh, in stronger stressor with higher levels of corticosteroids, uh, you have the activation of GR uh, receptors. And then you can have two different patterns of illness. I was talking with you about uh, atypical depression. You have a hyperactivity of the HP axis with lower MR. Uh, activity with lower concentration of glucocorticoid, and you have an opposite uh, pattern of depression, melancholic depression, with higher uh, activity of the HPA axis and higher levels of corticosteroids with uh, increased activity of the glucocorticoid receptors. Uh, most of the studies uh, have been done to assess the HPA axis with the dexamethasone suppression test. Uh, we developed uh, uh, a new test that, will, that can assess uh, HPX in depression, uh, that is prednisolone suppression test. Prednisolone is different from, from the hexamethasone because it, it links to uh, both receptors. The hexamethasone links just to GR receptors, and, and PRED, you can assess both receptors, have almost the same pharmacokinetic of cortisol uh, regarding half life and, and bind to the same uh, proteins. And so uh, you, you, you believe that this could be a more physiological assessment of the HP axis than the hexamethasone or even the CRH test. Uh, we just finished uh, last year uh, this, this review about how to assess HP axis uh, regarding the two receptors uh, in patients with depression and early life stress. And most of the studies will assess uh, with dexamethasone suppression test. And you, you can see here this, uh, this focus on uh, dex-CRH that could be uh, one of the, the most used uh, way to assess the HPA axis. And you can see that you have conflicted uh, results when you assess uh, human or, or man uh, regarding cortisol or ACTH. Uh, and, and then we believe that uh, Dexamethasone is quite different from, from uh, cortisol, as you can see, regarding selectivity of GR and MR uh, receptors. And so that's the reason that you are proposing prednisolone, that you can see that have a closer selectivity to cortisol. And you are assessing the MR receptors with fludocortisone as well. And this is the paper that you published uh, last month in the psychopharmacology, the role of uh, mineral receptor function in treatment-resistant depression. You assess uh, 24 patients, 24 subjects, patients and controls, and use prednisolone to assess both receptors. Uh, and uh, you, you assess uh, them with spirulactone, that is an antagonist of MR receptors, and use both PRED and, and uh, spirulactone to try to antagonize the, the, the MR uh, receptors. Uh, you, we can, can find that in, in healthy controls, uh, you, you don't have this, this, this problem. You, you can see that spirulactone increased cortisol, as you can see here, uh, in a very nice way. Antagonism of MR receptors increased cortisol. The prednisolone suppression test suppress uh, 
the, the, the levels of cortisol in assessment from 9 to 5 uh, a.m. You, you, you measure salivary cortisol. Uh, but when you include the PRED and spirulactone, uh, you can see that look like uh, dexamethasone suppression test. This is, happens in, in controls, but in patients, you cannot see this, this combination. The spirulactone uh, didn't increase the cortisol compared to placebo, and the combination of uh, MR antagonist and uh, mixed MR and GR had no effects on suppression of cortisol. And so uh, you could say that uh, you have a, a hypercortisolism in, this, in these patients and uh, MR malfunction, such as a downregulation uh, in these resistant depressive patients. Uh, you, you are almost finishing this, this paper, and probably you, you, you submitted soon uh, a collaboration with uh, endocrine professors here, uh, Margaret Castro and Ayrton Moreira and Professor Greve. You did an assessment uh, of these patients in the very beginning, and, and then 60 days after, you see the follow-up. In, in these 45, the Unipolar depressive patients, we found a, a sample with 70% with early life stress. And so quite in, uh, uh, high comorbidity of early life stress, uh, a, a very uh, different uh, outcome. You can see that uh, in red, patients with early life stress have a, a worst outcome regarding depression in two different scales. Uh, and the main result about psychometric, I should say, that is these patients, when you assess from suicide ideation, uh, the patients in the very beginning of a partial inpatient unit uh, treatment, they have almost the same suicide ideation, but 60 days after, the patients with depression without early life stress decrease almost zero suicide ideations, and the patients with early life stress still have strong suicide ideation. And uh, when you split the sample in responders and no responders, you can see almost 80% of the, the patients will have uh, early life stress. And so I should say that uh, high stress and depression mood are quite linked with suicide behavior. And uh, this, this is, could be something that you should try to understand. Uh, even if they have more comorbidity with epilepsy as well. Uh, this is our last paper that uh, have been accepted in the frontiers of psychiatry. Uh, we, we use two different assessments in patients with early life stress and depression. We use GR and MR agonist, we use dexamethasone as a GR agonist, and uh, fludocortisone as a MR uh, agonist. And so you can see a difference just in patients uh, regarding the use of MR. And so I would like to emphasize that the patients here are in a different pattern. They have lower cortisol level. Most of them are with a typical depression and, uh, and personality disorders as well. And we split the sample with patients with early life, without early life stress. You can see only a difference with the GR agonist dexamethasone with controls when you assess 70% of the sample with early life stress, both receptors uh, can see a difference in uh, comparing with placebo. And so I'd like to conclude saying that these studies demonstrate that early life stress could lead to change in the HAP axis and may develop depression in adults. Uh, these findings show quite uh, interesting uh, point regarding the imbalance of GR and MR in early life stress leading to hyperactivity of the HP axis in this sample of uh, uh, patients with atypical depression. Uh, you could say that depressive patients without early life stress or treatment responders with better uh, outcome use suppress more, more effectively with a GR agonist. But uh, our data suggests that MR function is fundamental in the neurobiology and treatment response of these patients with early life stress. And so, just to summarize uh, in one of my last slides, I should say that the normal development, you can have uh, a normal uh, levels of GR and MR in the hippocampus. And on the other hand, uh, patients that uh, were exposed to early life adversity, you have lower levels of GR uh, 
anymore in the hippocampus. And uh, when they uh, receive a stronger situation of stress or chronic stress like repeated uh, depressive episode or uh, epilepsy seizures, uh, this could activate uh, this cascade here and then uh, the binding of GRMR in the hippocampus will be changed. And here in the patients with early life stress, our hypothesis is that you have a poor binding uh, in these in this, uh, receptors. And so you can have a, a lack of inhibition. And uh, on the other hand, an uh, inhibition that could be uh, very uh, increased in the negative feedback. Uh, Alan Young, that is the, the, the head of the affective disorder now at the Institute of Psychiatry, saying that uh, the future uh, of, of the tar therapeutic targets in mood disorders will be the GI receptors. I'd like to add that could be as well the MR receptors. And uh, we publish a, a, a case series in the Psychopharmacology, Journal of Psychopharmacology, 2009, this is, was online, uh, that uh, in bipolar patients you, you, you have uh, improvement of response in bipolar affective disorders. They decrease the stress reaction uh, when you use uh, a mineralocorticoid uh, receptor antagonist like spirulactone. You know, spirulactone is a very cheap uh, drug used for uh, cardiovascular hypertension, for example, and this is could, could really help some patients. Uh, it's a great emotion, Roberto, to be here, and uh, mainly with these very important researchers, and I like to, to, to choose one of these emotions. I'm not sure which one of them I like to, maybe the, the first line here. And I like to just remember some memories uh, and, uh, and, and just say thank you to to my group here. Uh, you have an, another PhD student that is not here, Vinicius, and I'd like to thank Professor Griff that helped me to come back to Brazil. Professor Tony Clear that uh, I'm still working with him, uh, our patients, and mainly to the group, uh, and Roberto that uh, is very generous with uh, young artists like this guy here, and, and not so young assistant professor like myself. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>